There's a passage in Revelation that has always fascinated me. Revelation has a lot of things in it that are kind of uh, difficult for us to understand, but this one uh, is interesting. The book starts off with a series of letters to the churches in Asia Minor. And John is writing to these various churches, giving them instructions, uh, commending them for the good things they were doing and pointing out the, the failings that they had. And in chapter 2, he writes to the church in Ephesus. And he makes this interesting statement. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And he says, I know your deeds. Now this is Jesus talking. John is saying these are what Je this is what Jesus has said. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have twi tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Now at this point, what does it sound like he's saying up to this point? Yeah, you're doing a great job, man. You're, you're, you're doing hard work and you're persevering and you're standing for the truth. I mean, it, it this, up to this point, if, if you were at the church in Ephesus, you think, yeah, man, Jesus is, is really commending us for our hard work and all the things that we've done, the way we stand for the truth and everything's great. But then he throws in this final statement. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. What in the world could he be talking about? He doesn't go on to explain exactly what he means. You have forsaken your first love. What could he be talking about? Now, if, if back when you first started dating, you found someone that you just fell head over heels in love with, and you just thought they were the most wonderful thing on the planet, and this is your first real love, and somebody says you have forsaken your first love, what would you what would that mean? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, you know, if you if you found somebody that you just fell madly in love with and now if you fall madly in love with somebody what do you tend to do? What are some of the uh, things that, that would signify this relationship? Okay, you'd want to please that other person. You do everything you can to please them. Yes, what else? You focus on them. Sure, you give them some attention. What else would you do? If you're in love with someone, you think about them all the time. Sure. You'd want to spend time with them. You'd want to talk to them. You, you, you know. <laughs> and if you quit doing those things, then they, you might say, well, you have forsaken your first love. You're not doing those things that you did at first. But this... He's saying you have forsaken your first love. Well, obviously, what should be the first love of a Christian? Christ. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I want to know Christ. Nothing else matters. Everything else I count but a loss. 
I want to know Christ. So if you forsake your first love and you're a Christian, then something has changed in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, what in the world could he be talking about? Well, I think there are some things that would be that we need to look at. This happens to Christians. Why would a Christian forsake his first love? What could cause a Christian to forsake his love for Christ? Yeah, he gets distracted. Uh, some things in the world, he gets too busy. He, he doesn't have time to be a Christian. Uh, he, he gets interested in something else. So it's possible. It happens to people. You know, some people, when they first become Christians, they're so excited and they do everything they can. They go to Bible class. They go to worship. They, they just share the gospel with people. They carry tracts and leave them in places. And, and then over the years, they get involved in other things and they kind of lose interest in being a Christian. They just, just kind of quit doing some of the things. Well, basically, that's what John is saying here. This church had gotten all excited about serving the Lord and they were all thrilled about being Christians. And, but now they have left their first love. And he says, you need to get back to that. <clears throat> so there are some things that we need to look at that are evidences that I might have left my first love. These are some, some scriptural things that I think are evidences that we may have left our first love or that we're losing our interest in our first love. Now, in the world of relationships, what do we call it if you lose your first love? Ma'am? Okay, but that's one. Yeah, the honeymoon's over. Uh, sometimes we say uh, we're falling out of love. Can you fall out of love with Jesus Christ? Yeah, sure you can. You can fall out of love with Jesus Christ. So, what are some evidences that I may have left my first love? Well, I think the first one is when the Lord is not the most important thing in my life. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Now, the Jews were trying to trap him. The... Uh, over the centuries, the Jews had realized they could not keep the law of Moses, that it was just impossible. And so they got to thinking, well, let's focus on the Ten Commandments. There's actually 614 different laws in the law of Moses. We can't keep them all, but maybe we can keep the Ten Commandments. Guess what they discovered? Can't keep those either. So then they got the bright idea, well, what if we can keep one of the Ten Commandments? I love the way human logic works. <laughs> you know, God's given us 614 laws. Maybe we can just keep one of them. That'll be enough. Well, if you decide that you just got to keep one of them, what's, what's your next big decision? Which one? I mean, God gave ten separate commandments right off the bat. Well, which one is the most important? And so the Jews were trying to trap Jesus and they said, well, which is the greatest commandment? And they were hoping he would pick one of the ten and then what would they say? Well, what about these other ones? Aren't they important too? So they were, whatever Jesus said, they thought they had him on the horns of a dilemma. Well, Jesus blew their minds when they said, what's the greatest commandment? He says, well, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. So they couldn't trap him. So the first evidence that I have left my first love, that I have left my love for Jesus Christ, that it has grown. Now, what's the danger of being a Christian for a long time? Complacency. Complacency. Yeah. The same thing with being married for a long time. Uh, it's easy to take each other for granted. It, it's easy to kind of lose the the excitement and the spark and to, to doing the things that you did at first. And sometimes as Christians, we get so involved in living life and we've been Christians 10, 20, 30, 40 years and other things get important and we just kind of lose our, our excitement about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so one of the dangers of one of the evidences that I have left my first love, if Jesus Christ is my first love, if he's the most important thing in my life, then I'll do certain things. So the danger is that we lose that excitement, that, that thrill, that awe, that wonder about being a Christian and serving the Lord. And so when the Lord is not the most important thing in my life, how do you know what's the most important thing in your life is? Ma'am? Okay, one thing, what you think about. I mean, when you first started dating, what about that person that you were madly in love with? How long did you go between thinking about them? <laughs> Not long. You know, you want to be with that person. You call them on the phone. You write them letters. You, you know, you, you want to show them how much you care. And you're, they're always on your mind. And the same thing with, with Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is the most important thing in my life and the center of my life, then I think about him every day. He, he occupies a part of my life. And so the first thing I need to ask myself is what is the most important thing in my life? Is it being a success? Is it getting my education? Uh, is it building relationships with people? Is it having enough money to get by on? What is most important? What occupies my energy and my efforts? And so if the Lord is not the most important thing in my life, then I must seriously ask myself, have I begun to leave my first love? The second thing we might ask ourselves is, <clears throat> when I do not spend time with God's Word, then maybe I've lost my first love. Now, why is that important? <laughs> in Psalms, he says, I have hidden your Word in my heart. So that I might not sin against you. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Now, what singular quality was David noted for? His relationship. And what was it called? What does the Bible say about David? A man after God's own heart. Now, man, that is... <laughs> I wish that could be put on my tombstone. Here was a man after God's own heart. The Bible says that about David. Did David have his faults? Yeah, he committed some of those horrible sins known to me. With one fell swoop, he broke five of the Ten Commandments when he cheated with Bathsheba, murdered her husband. But the Bible still says, at the end of the day, he was a man after God's own heart. And part of that was, he says, I delight in your decrees. And when you read David's writings, he says this over and over and over. I can't wait to get to God. I can't wait to go to worship. I can't wait to study the word. I can't wait to make it part of my life. Now, why is this so crucial for a Christian? What's the word of God to us? All right, for one thing, it's our guidance. But more than that. Sir? Okay, it gives us strength. It gives us guidance. It's God speaking to us. Now, why is that important? When you, when you, started, when you first fell in love with someone and you started wanting to be with this person, what, what makes most relationships work? What's the number one complaint in relationships? Communication. Communication. Most marriage counselors will say the biggest problem in marriage is communication or a lack thereof. When you first date, what is it like? You know, you want to talk to that person. You want to be with that person. And I, I hate talking on the telephone, even to this day. I don't like talking on the telephone. I'd much rather look you right in the eye and talk to you. 
Most of my telephone conversations are very brief because <laughs> I just don't like talking on telephone. But when you're dating, what do you do? You spend hours <laughs> on the phone. <laughs> you want to talk to this person. Communication is, is a crucial element of a relationship. You talk and you talk and you talk and you talk and you talk some more and you talk and you talk. <laughs> well, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to talk to him. Now, how does he talk to us? Through his word. Yeah, that's why this is so crucial. If I am not anxious to spend time in God's word, what am I telling Jesus Christ? I don't really want to talk to you. If you were dating someone and they called you up, or if you were dating someone and you called them up, and they said, I don't want to talk to you, what would you think? You know, you say, okay, you're busy now. When can I talk? Well, I don't think I'm going to have any time to talk to you in the next six weeks or so. You think, uh-oh, something's wrong with this relationship. Something's terrible. Well, if I'm not re regularly communicating with Jesus Christ, what does that say about my relationship with Him? Something's not right. Now, he talks to me through his word. How do I talk to him? In prayer. That's why the Bible emphasizes those two things so much. Because communication is crucial to every relationship. And I must talk to Jesus. I must listen to what he has to say. It's absolutely essential for a good relationship. You can't go days and weeks without studying the scriptures and think I have a great relationship with Christ. It just doesn't work that way. That's why worship is so important. That's why studying our Bibles is so important. That's why Bible study, that's why prayer. This is crucial. If I love Jesus Christ, if he is my first love, if he's the most important thing in my life, I want to talk to him. When a couple goes for days or weeks without communicating, that shows that relationship is in serious trouble. It just, it just is. We are made to communicate. And to have good relationships with someone, we must have good communications. And so if I don't spend time in God's word, there's something wrong with my relationship with Jesus Christ. Number three. If I'm not willing to help others, that shows that I have a problem with my relationship with Christ. John said, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Now, what's this got to do with my relationship with Jesus Christ? Sure. He says, how we treat others is a reflection of our relationship with Christ. Why? How do you love Jesus Christ? Yeah. You see, what does Jesus need me to do for him? You know, he doesn't need anything I can do for him. You know, he, does he need my money? No. What can I do for him? Well, he says, the way you show your love for me is by loving my people. And so that's why it's so crucial that we love others. We help other people. That is the chief way we show our love for Christ. Matter of fact, what did Jesus say about how people will know we are his disciples. Do you love people? 
He didn't say people will know you're my disciples if you memorize the scriptures or if you can quote the Bible or if you go to church seven times a week. He didn't say that. He says people will know you're my followers, my disciples, if you love one another. That is the number one quality of a Christian. Does he love other people? Who is it harder to love, Jesus or people? <laughs> Loving Jesus isn't that hard. Why? He first loved us. He always does what's best for us. He provides everything for us. Loving him's not that hard. Why is it hard to love people? <laughs> Ma'am? They, they don't love us. That's right. <laughs> if you'd love me, I'd love you back. <laughs> yeah. There are people in this world. Now, I have been blessed being, I've always been around people that love me. But I know this is hard to believe, but there are people out there that don't love me. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I have run into people in this world who wanted to hurt me. There are difficult people in the world. Some people will aggravate you to death. Some people despise you or hate you. None of us likes that. That's not our nature. We don't like people that don't like us. If you don't like me, fine. Just stay away from me. Don't bother me. But Jesus comes along and says, Well, if you love me, I'm going to ask you to love those people. And then he says to do what with them? I'm, ma'am? Do good to them? What a ridiculous kind. What else am I supposed to do? Teach them? Put their needs ahead of mine? I'm supposed to pray for them? Man, that is hard stuff. <laughs> It is hard to pray for the welfare of somebody that has just tried to do you dirt. It's just hard to do. If someone has lied about you or taken something from you or uh, taken advantage of you in some way, it is very difficult to go to God and say, God, I ask your blessings upon this rat. <laughs> I want to do what David said sometimes with his enemies. Get them, God. <laughs> Wipe them off the face of the planet. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm a nice guy if you're nice to me. But boy, if you come at me, I'm... <laughs> well, he says, if you love me. And this is one of the hardest parts about loving Jesus Christ. If you love me, I want you to love others. I want you to love other people. Well, some people are not too hard to love. But there are some people that are just tough to love. And guess which ones need the most love? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got a cousin that nobody can stand. I mean, he is the most obnoxious person on the planet. And I keep telling myself, God sent him into my life to see how I'll treat him. <laughs> Everywhere I've ever been, there's always somebody that just tr somehow gets on your nerves. And I think God sends those people into our lives to see if we will really show them concern and love, pray for them. And Jesus says, that's one of the ways you show me love is by loving the difficult people in life. Number four. If I do not love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, the first category of folks were the difficult ones, the enemies, the folks that didn't like us. Now he's saying, you also have to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We have to love other Christians. 
Do you love your brothers and sisters in, in your own family? Probably. <laughs> I remember I was three years old, or I was just two months shy of my third birthday, when they brought my brother home from the hospital, my baby brother. And I remember I was sent to live with my grandparents for the last two weeks before the baby was born. And my mother, the last thing my mother told me before she left, she says, you can come home when your baby sister gets here. So I was expecting a baby sister. Well, my grandmother came to me and said, I just got a call from your mother and your baby brother has been born. And I started crying. She said, what's wrong? I said, I can't go home. <laughs> Why not? Because I, mama said I couldn't come home till I had a baby sister. <laughs> well, from then on, I had problems with that boy. I mean, he was not a sister. And, you know, I had everything just perfect. My life was great. I had all the attention. <laughs> everything was great. And then when they brought him home, suddenly he got all the attention. I never did see any need for bringing him into the family. We just didn't need him. <laughs> I remember the first week he, he, they, we brought him home. I was living in Shreveport, Louisiana at the time. And he was crying. In the, and he was, they put him in his bassinet in the back room and he was crying. And my parents were in the kitchen joking. And my dad said, I guess we're going to have to go spank that boy. So the next thing they heard, I was whomping on him. They, <laughs> and he was pitching. And they went running back there and I was up on the side of the bassinet just to spank him. And I said, well, you told me. <laughs> I thought he needed it. And throughout his life, I tried to help the boy, but he just never appreciated it. But God says we have to love other Christians. Why is that so important to, to Jesus? That I love you. Or that you love me. Why is that so crucial? All right. John said, for one thing, if you can't love your brother who you know, you certainly can't say you love God who you've never seen. Why else is it crucial that we love each other? Our love is a reflection of our appreciation. Of our yes, that's probably the best theological definition yet. That our love is a reflection of the God, love God has for us. And he says, I have loved you. Now, what is God's ultimate goal for me? To be like Him. Well, if His number one quality is love, what's my number one quality going to have to be? I'm going to have to love. And so if I'm going to be like God, I have to love people. And first of all, I have to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. What about my black brothers and sisters? What about my Arabic brothers and sisters? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have to love. What about my poor brothers and sisters? Or my rich brothers and sisters? Yeah. They're part of the family. And we have to love each other. We're part of the family. And again, that, that idea that we are reflecting the love of God is crucial. God says, I want you to love other Christians because that makes you like me. And if I want to be like God, I have to love you people. <laughs> Number five. When I see the commands of Jesus as restrictions on my happiness rather than expressions of his love, I may have left my first love. Is this a problem? Yes. A lot of people resist Christianity. Why? Why do you think 
Yeah. A lot of people think, well, if I become a Christian, man, that's going to take all the fun out of life. I, I can't do all the things I want to do. I can't have a good time. A lot of people believe that Christianity is a cosmic killjoy. That it just takes all the fun out of life. John says, whoever has my, or Jesus says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. How should I look at the commands of Jesus Christ? Yeah. When you have children, you have to give them some rules. Why do you give them those rules? Yeah. I never made a single rule for my children just to be mean. I never told them they had to do something or not do something simply to take out the fun of life. I never did that. Every rule I gave, I did. Now, I might have been mistaken a few times, but I never gave one I thought was for their detriment. It was always for their good. And as humans, we make mistakes, but God doesn't. Every rule that God has given us, every command is for what? For our good. Every single one of them. God never gave me a single command just to be mean to me or just to take all the joy out of life. Matter of fact, Jesus says, I came that they might have life and what? And have it abundantly. Jesus wants us to have the abundant life. He wants us to have a great life. He wants us to be full of joy. Paul said 14 times in one little section of, of, of uh, Philippians. 14 times in one small section of Philippians. Rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Now what does that sound like? He wants us to have joy. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to have a good time. Christians are the happiest people on the planet. Statistics show that Christians live longer than non-Christians. Why? We're happier. We have less stress. It's just the way the world works. And so... If I am a Christian and I look at God's rules as something designed to keep me from having fun, that's, that's a wrong concept. Number six. When I love the world, that shows I have deserted my first love. John says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what in the world does he mean by don't love the world? Yeah, he's not talking about you don't love the mountains and the rivers and the critters and all the blessings. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what he means. He's talking about the ways of the world. When the Bible uses the world, world, the word world in this context, it's talking about that which is opposed to God's system. The world is used here in the sense of this is what is anti-God. And if we're not careful, we can learn to love the world. Why would we do that? Ma'am? Okay, for one thing, we live in the world. The ways of the world are constantly surrounding us. People influence us. Our culture is heavily involved in the world. And so it's easy for us to slide into that loving the world. What are the world's values? Ma'am? Well, they're not God's, but what are some of the world's values that, that Christians inadvertently adopt? Well, the 
selfish. Yes. Yes. The world is very selfish. It's about me. And yes, that's probably the biggest thing we have to be careful of is thinking everything revolves around me. Yes. Everything. Do what? Everything's fine. Yeah, you, whatever you want to do is fine. You make the choice. It's up to you. Uh, this is called existentialism. It came into this country a little over 100 years ago. It became a major movement. And now existentialism is the number one philosophy in America. And existentialism basically says, it's a fancy word for saying, you get to choose. It has reached the incredible proportion nowadays that if you don't consider yourself a male, even though you were born male, just call yourself a female. <laughs> if you don't want to be a female, call yourself a male. If you don't want to be either, just call yourself transgender or whatever. Non, non yes. What's that? Non binary. Non -binary. <laughs> And I, I love this. Uh, th there's a commercial on for some kind of medication. And it says, this might not work if you are assigned female at birth. <laughs> In other words, if you're born a female, this medication won't work, even though you call yourself something else now. And so our, our world value has literally come to the point where you decide what you are even. If you don't want to be a male or a female, or if you want to be a butterfly, that's fine. Just call yourself a butterfly. <laughs> and we all have to accept that. <laughs> so the world has a lot of weird values out there. And if I love the world, then I buy into the world's values. But I can't love Christ and love the world. He says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. <clears throat> and then we have time for one more. When I'm unable to forgive someone who has offended me, I have left my first love. Why so? Well, Christ forgave us. Yeah. Uh, First John says, if anyone says I love God yet hates his brother, he is a liar. If someone has offended me, I must forgive. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you don't forgive your brother, then what? God's not going to forgive you. It's that simple. And so we have to be willing to forgive. Again, what's God's number one goal for me? To be like him. And he forgives. He says, you must forgive. This is not optional. This is not something I get to choose to do. He says, if you want to be in my kingdom, you will forgive. It's that simple. If I refuse to forgive then I am simply not, I have already forsaken my first love. Thank you for being with us. We'll talk to you next time. <clears throat>